31 p.m. Um, the Wednesday, May 19th meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Um, we will start off with public comments. Uh, oh, first, let's do roll. Sorry. Um, Jill. Here. Um, Kristen. Here. Abigail. Here. Emma. Present. Amanda. Aki, here. Um, Andrew said he's going to be late. Jerry, I think, might be late. Do we have, do we have a quorum, right? To get Annika? That's yeah, we have six, so we have a quorum. Um, all right, uh, so public, looks like we have some folks on. Um, uh, for public comment, uh, we've got 10 minutes. Uh, if you understand the raise hand function in Zoom, if you have participants um, and hit raise hand, um, I can see that you want to talk. Uh, if you get confused by that, you can just raise your hand in the screen. Um, so for folks, if anyone wants to talk, please either do the raise hand function or raise hand um, physically in the screen. Let's see one. Um, Beth, and then please, um, even though folks can see you on Zoom, please announce your name for uh, for the audio portion. Thank you. Um, I'm Beth Merrill. I'm a parent of a third and ninth grader. Um, I just I wanted to first say I appreciate the addition of the sports camps for elementary school students that I recently saw in the, the communications to parents. Um, my daughter has attended an ELL camp free LL camp, ELL, English language learner camp for the last several years. Um, and both my son and daughter attended a transition to kindergarten camp um, when they were coming to Union Elementary. And I just wonder if given the severe shortage of summer camps in our area this summer, I actually teach at a summer camp and it filled up like in early March, earlier than it has ever filled up before, um, all of them. And if there is, in fact, funding for more summer programming, um, that if there might be a way to use those two models of those camps, which are very simple, um, you know, just kids being together um, on school property, but socializing, um, just being with each other, um, more opportunities for, for more kids to do that. Um, I'm especially concerned with um, some of the ELL kids who really, I don't see them in the traditional summer camps. Um, and also just kids who have been remote for the last year. I know three peers of my daughter who have barely left their homes in the past year. They've been, they're remote students. And I just worry about what the transition is going to be like for them um, in the fall and just what it's been. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that going to the high school or the elementary school or wherever it would, would be able to be hosted for a week for a half day camp for them could just make like a huge difference. Um, and it doesn't need to be even a huge theme, you know, um, I'm running a camp, you know, where we're um, reading, reading books to kids and they're doing projects with the books and, you know, you have some art supplies, you have a place for them to run around and that makes a camp experience for some kids and just definitely thinking about those kids who don't get that experience usually and this year, um, you know, even parents who are pretty on top of camps may have missed the boat for camps, just given the, the high demand. So I just wonder if there's a way to look at those models that we already have in place and hopefully, you know, use some funding to make sure that we're including kids who, um, who really could use the extra support. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else uh, have a comment? Thanks, and I see like Mia has joined us, um, and Jerry and Andrew are running late. Um, 
So let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda, um, except for the superintendent's report. I'd like to pull that for discussion, please. Okay. Uh, do we have a second to Jill's motion to approve the consent agenda with the uh, superintendent's report um, pulled for discussion? I had a question just about the calendar. Is that something that we are actually approving via approving the consent agenda? Yes, we are approving the school board meeting calendar. If you want to pull that, we can discuss that as well. Okay. Yep. I just do you, want to, do you want to amend Jill's motion and make a new motion? Uh, motion crafting. This would be a first. <laughs> Uh, I make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda aside from discussion about the uh, calendar and the superintendent's report. Great. Do I have a second for that? I'll second that and withdraw my original motion. Right. Thanks, Jill. Um, let's go to a vote. Jill? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Emma? Aye. Amanda? Yes. Mia? Aye. Great. Um, consent agenda passes. Uh, so let's move on to discussion of the superintendent's report and then the school board meeting calendar. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Jill, to um, talk about the superintendent's report or whatever question you have. Great, thanks. Yeah, there was just one section. I, I always really appreciate the superintendent's report. I find a lot of really good information. So I hope folks do take the time to take a look at that. Um, and I know that the, the rules for COVID are sort of in a constant state of, of shifting by the minute. So I was hoping to get some clarification from Libby about the statement. Um, it says, obviously, right now, the Agency of Education is predicting that the 2021, 22, 2022 school year will be back to typical schooling. We expect that all people will be asked to wear a mask inside. And I just wondered um, if you could get into the specifics of that a little bit, because I know certain buildings may not have elementary school kids, but some might. And obviously, again, knowing that this is several months away, but I just wondered if you could just comment on that or, or clear that up, because I know a lot of, at least the middle schoolers are pretty stoked who are eligible to not wear masks because they're getting their vaccine. So I was hoping you could explain that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked to take that mask off too. Um, so that comment um, came from, so I wrote that on what, May 13th or something? You pointed that out to me, Jill. Um, so it was before the CDC made any guidance and we work, we have a weekly phone meeting with Dan French, the Secretary of Education. And Dan has said in verbal communication many times that he expects schools, <clears throat> employees and, and students to be wearing a mask next year um now those are in verbal communications nothing is written yet and we have to go by written communication um so that's where that comment came from i think that they'll probably address the situation when we know more and are closer to that time period what we do know now is that they're get well we don't know it but they're they're estimating that um under 12 will be available for vaccination um in the early fall our under 12 year olds so that would include our elementary school kids i can i can pretty much bet that if uh elementary school kids are starting or under 12 year olds are starting without a mat or starting without a vaccination opportunity that they will be in masks um as for the uh the upper grades they are batting back and forth around do we ask for student vaccination records around COVID? Do we not? Um, they're, they're batting around all of those big hefty ethical questions right now um, at the AOE when I say they. So we really don't know yet. Um, but as of right now, what we're being told verbally is that we will be in masks. That could change very quickly. So we don't, we don't know that yet, but that's what we're being told right now. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions on that? Thank you, Jill and Libby. Uh, Kristen, uh, the calendar. Yeah, this is probably just maybe an administrative slip, but I wanted to clarify. Um, it says that all meetings will be either virtual or a meeting in person at MHS. And I wondered if RVS was still gonna be included as a meeting site for school board director meetings. Um, 
That's a really good catch, Kristen. I yeah, thank you. Really good catch. Thank you for pulling that. Um, yeah, the board typically does every fourth meeting at RVS, so we'll make sure that we get that corrected and put it back in the school board agenda for next time. Thank you for, for, for providing that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure our community folks would know that there would be a meeting closer at hand at least once a month. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks Thank for catching you. that. Yeah. Great, excellent. Um, I had a, one more question about the wording at the top of the calendar. Yeah, go for it. Um, board members will either all be participating virtually or all will be meeting in person. I just wonder if it's necessary to use the word all, like wouldn't there be a possibility um, as with recent meetings where some of us are virtual and some of us are in person? sure why that, that that language was on there um we can we've tried in the past pre-pandemic without a huge amount of success as jim and andrew can attest to um for people in a more open meeting session uh being virtual when they had to travel for work or something like that and it wasn't a huge success in terms of their ability to hear everything um but that was pre-pandemic we're a little better at it now <laughs> i think all yeah, of them. And and Mia seemed to to have okay success at the first yeah. part of the retreat. Let's, um, Emma, do you, does someone want to propose a motion that we approve the superintendent's report and the calendar as amended with a change that will- Jim, I think, the... Jim, I think Amanda has her hand up. Oh, okay. um, Amanda. Yeah, I just had, I had a question regarding holidays, like multicultural holidays, if we are taking that into consideration when we built in our calendar for the year, like, you know, like holidays that other people celebrate, or, or are we looking at just federal holidays or? Are there holidays that conflict? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the date, but like, you know, I, that's why I'll ask you if that has ever been taken into consideration um, when people celebrate. I think traditionally, Jim, you can probably answer it a little bit better. It's just traditionally the first and third Wednesdays, so it doesn't influence the city councilor meeting. Correct, Jim? Yes, we have not. That's that's basically what we go by. Um, And then school vacations. We try to work around school vacations. Yeah, but if, if school is in session and it's a it's a first or third Wednesday for meeting, as yeah, you know, this the school is otherwise doing business. Okay, thanks. Um, but it's a good point. Uh, do I have an amendment to approve the superintendent's report? and the calendar with the two changes noted that um, every fourth meeting will at least will aim to have an RVS, depending on how soon we get back in person, um, and then removing the language of all. So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Um, great. Uh, let's do a vote. Um, Jill? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Etiquette? Aye. Uh, Emma? Aye. Uh, Amanda? Aye. Mia? Aye. Great. Passes. Um, now we're on to uh, learning focus. I'm very excited to hear from um, several MSMS students on the MSMS uh, new sustainability course. Uh, this is always a treat to hear from students. So I'm not sure which of the group is planning to take a lead, but um, I'll turn it over to all of you and Don and Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us and for having us. My name is uh, Don Taylor, and shortly you are going to meet the student partners I've been working with. I've also been working uh, very closely with Sarah Popowitz, who works uh, for Up for Learning, 
Uh, she spent a lot of time in the classroom before transitioning to that, and she's been critical uh, for our development and our ideas. And um, I've, I'm not sure how we're going to go about uh, with the slideshow. I've put the slideshow in the chat for everyone. Uh, but if we can have one of the hosts uh, maybe gotcha. share that. Oh, gotcha. perfect. So uh, Livy is going to uh, share the slideshow. And then our students uh, will take it away after the first slide. All right, and yep. Uh, so again, uh, my name is uh, Don Taylor and we've been charged, or I've been charged, we've been charged with uh, developing a sustainability class at Main Street Middle School. And to do that, we've been working with uh, Up for Learning and our student partners who've been critical to, uh, to our project and to the development thus far. I'm gonna turn it over to them and uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, we'd appreciate it. Um, the CPS team at Main Street Middle School is a group of youth in the sixth and seventh grade who wanna take action for the UN SDG goals in our school system and work towards a more sustainable future, along with supporting youth to partnership in our schools. In the corner, these are the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or UN SDGs. We've been looking at these goals throughout the year and aiming towards helping and solve these problems in our school. There are multiple other schools around the world that do the same thing that we do. We meet months, once a month to talk about this and our current progress. Is that you, Olivia? Oh, I think Olivia uh, might have She's frozen. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Olivia, you back? Olivia, can you go over this slide? Oh, sorry. Go away. <laughs> I'm sorry. My dad's walking in on me. <laughs> um. Youth Adult Partnership is a big part of who we are at CPS. We focus on relationships, having youth and adult as equal and mutual partners in our community, and having shared decision-making and responsibility. So Olivia, I think when you froze out, you we, we haven't gotten there yet. We're on our goal slide with the, I think when you froze, you missed that. Oh, did I not go over the goal one? No, can you see the screen? Oh, um, well, our goal is to develop a sustainability program model at Main Street Middle School for the 2021 to 2022 school year by sharing our voice, skills, and vision to the planning team. Youth and adult partnership is a big part of who we are at CPS. Um, we focus on relationships, having youth and adult as equal and mutual partners in our community, and having shared decision making and responsibility. What brought our team together? We wanted youth voice to be more prominent within our community and ultimately around the world. We want to educate others on the need for this and how equality all around is important. We plan to create a sustainability class to inform people peers on this topic. We have been looking at opportunities to make changes. This is why our group joined this team. Um, my name is Molly and I was interested in a new opportunity to learn about people that are struggling and to create solutions for those problems. Change is very important to me and I think that change will be beneficial to my community. I look forward to taking our work to the next level in upcoming years, and I believe that we have a strong connection to our community so far. My name is Olivia, and I joined CPS because I could state my ideas and goals and get to work towards them with others who have similar thoughts. Uh, my name is Asa, and I joined this team because I think it's a great place to work with other people who care about similar issues that I do, 
and also because it's a great chance to work on leadership skills, um, which can be really valuable in later life. Um, as well, I also believe that youth adult partnership is a really important thing, and so it's been really amazing to work with this group um, using that. Marie, we're having a hard time hearing you. Can you un try and unmute again one, one more time? Could you not hear me? Go ahead. Okay, Um. sorry. My name is Marie and I joined because I knew that there are loads of people who are really passionate about the things that I'm passionate about, but they don't are either afraid of sharing their voice or they don't have the opportunity to share their thoughts on the matter. And with this program, I can represent those people. My name is Leo, and I joined this group because I knew it would allow me to expand my knowledge of issues such as the environment, which I'm really interested in and passionate about around the world, and what will help solve those issues. So next slide, please. So we started our brainstorming process by writing in Jamboards and sharing about the strengths and opportunities of MSMS. And we also had a brief discussion about the SDGs and which ones we wanted to prioritize in our work. Some of our strengths include good leadership skills and acceptance, and some of our opportunities we thought of include a self-sustained school garden and all gender bathrooms. We attended worldwide conferences to learn about youth adult partnerships and how we can apply them to our work and goals. These partnerships are important to show that every anyone and everyone deserves to have their voice heard. Um, next slide, please. We, we keep track of what we have done and where we are going on the YPAR map. And this has helped us to think about topics such as building relationships, identifying issues and developing questions. The YPAR map is the youth participatory action research cycle that shows us where we have been and where we need to go in order to accomplish our goals and creating a more sustainable school. Next slide. Um, we really wanted to engage the MSMS community in this class and just um, having some say in what goes into this class because um, we really want it to be engaging for students. And um, so one of the things we did to include our community was uh, send out a survey um, with questions about just things that kids might value or want to learn in next year's class or have incorporated. Uh, some of the data is on the next slide. Some of the results we have from the survey 70% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that project-based learning made them more interested in learning. 92% of respondents agree or strongly agree that they would like to design projects that have a positive impact. 96% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that learning about social and environmental justice is important to them. Um, these other pie charts show other data like that. In conclusion, we recommended that the, our program and class should include a Youth Adult Sustainability Advisor, Advisory Committee working in equal partnership, opportunities for youth voice around issues we are passionate about, youth and adults designing curriculum together based on our passions and the UN SDGs, community partnerships and mentoring, and project-based learning. Now that we've analyzed the data from our survey, we might ask ourselves, what's next? What do we do now? And so from the data we collected, we noticed that the majority of our respondents were most passionate about climate action and gender equality. And with this information, our CPS group has started brainstorming potential project ideas that would fit our community's hopes, such as a school garden, a food drive, and an all gender bathrooms. Just today, we 
scoped out and worked at the feast farm over by Agway, and we were able to weed and help out on the community garden that is at um, the farm. And we saw that it could be a very cool place that we could have for our class that we can have All right, is there uh, one more slide or is that, there we go. Um, so first of all, I just wanna thank our student partners. Um, they basically done and led the project. I'd like to thank Sarah for her support and her work. And if there are any questions, um, let us know. Yeah, thank you so much. It was super informative and great job, everyone. Fascinating presentation. Uh, Mia. That was awesome. Thank you very, very much for um, the work that you put in to do all that research and the work that you put in to, to present it to, to all of us. Um, and I'm curious, I saw, I, I think the next steps sound great. I'm curious if what you are proposing is that this become a part of the curriculum, it seems like that is the case, but I just wanted to confirm if, if that's what you're asking or if this is a different kind of initiative. I got a thumbs up for from Asa, I see. So that's really neat. Yeah, the this will be a class next year that's gonna be taught to students five through eight. Um, and I'm in charge of listening to our student partners to make sure that that class is engaging uh, and as effective as possible. I'm going to do what they tell me, Good. basically. <laughs> I don't know if you want to advertise that, Don, too much. <laughs> to further your question, Mia, uh, our our family consumer science teacher retired this year. She from um, from Main Street Middle School, and uh, we couldn't replace that position. There weren't any candidates for it. It was our opportunity to relook at what we wanted to do with that fine arts position or that fine arts availability. Um, and so we tagged on to see if he would be interested in leading some student work around what the students want. Um, and so Don's been working with these fine students all year to design um, a course that builds on the topic of sustainability. Um, so that will be getting kids outside at the middle school level, will be taking on leadership to leadership opportunities, um, and it will replace the, what has traditionally been family consumer science. And just can I add a little bit to that, Libby, uh, as part of my uh, Dynamics 802, 7 and 8 team uh, pr uh, before uh, the pandemic, we had spent seven or eight years on a green team. Uh, and I know uh, Beth Merrill, who is part of the public, uh, had a student who participated in that. And we were working on a wide variety of uh, sustainability issues. And this will hopefully bring it to the entire uh, student body at Main Street Middle School instead of just keeping it within one program. And so uh, we have a lot of experience doing this, but we're very excited about the opportunities uh, that it presents. Excellent. And Wanda? Thanks. Um, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Uh, great job. Um, I guess the question that I have is I've been just thinking a lot about, you know, um, our community members with disabilities and, uh, and the gardening and like how accessible it is for people with wheelchairs. Um, and just like if you thought about disability when you were thinking about these goals. Just to uh, sort of, we haven't specifically identified that uh, area, but that would that's exactly the type of suggestion that we're going to be seeking from the community. And that's exactly the type of thing that we would build in uh, using the UNS, uh, UN SDG Sustainable Development Goals, where they talk about reduced inequalities and how we can look at perhaps populations of folks who may not be having access to those sort of resources or may not be able to get that involvement and bringing those issues to the student partners and having them think about it and work on it and develop the solutions are the projects, uh, hopefully that will be integrated into the curriculum and into the program so that we can allow the students to experience 
that sort of problem solving uh, in, on a community-based issue. Good, thanks, Hi. Kristen. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, students. It's great to see. Um, just your process seemed really uh, comprehensive and just all the input that you got from your, your peers and your fellow students to really um, shape what this course could look like next year is really impressive. Um, something that the school board has been talking about, I think even before my time, I'm pretty new to the school board, but is the, the idea of getting more youth voice onto the school board. And so I'm curious what your experience has been like kind of being on this equal footing and being in these youth adult partnerships that you've been talking about about and what that's been like for you. And I know that you're here in part to collect feedback from us, but I'm also interested to hear any feedback from you that uh, that you might have and how we might go about, um, you know, soliciting student involvement and feedback. And I'm just interested to hear about how that's been for you all to be in those positions of um, leadership and making decisions and shaping process and like uh, Mr. Taylor said that he's like actually taking lead from you and following and following through on that. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about any of that. And thank you so much for your presentation tonight. It's great to have you all here. Thanks. It looks like Molly wants to answer. Molly? Uh, yeah, I would just say that um, I think it would be a great opportunity to have um, like a team um, that would be work with the school board a little bit. Um, I think it's great to have some youth input and I don't know where you can get inf information from both sides. And I think that would be really important and a really big step for building youth adult, youth adult partnerships. Um, I think that so far it's been working pretty well in like our meetings at first it was kind of uncomfortable for some people i know because you never really know when to step up or step down but now that we've learned how and like we've gotten used to it we've really been able to connect more with each other and learn from experiences awesome great well thank you everyone it looks like uh, mr taylor has offered you guys to come back next year and give us an update, which I think we'd all love to hear. Um, so thanks all for your great work and for the great presentation. I know you um, had to put a lot of thought and research into it and you all did fantastic. So um, so thanks for all the great work and this is a really exciting program that we're, we're really pleased to hear about and um, we're gonna be excited to hear the update next year. See how it goes. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come back anytime. Thank you. Great job, team. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Great. And now we have um, Mara Iverson, uh, who is coming back to do another um, bias, don't have just bias training. Um, so uh, Mara, I think we're a little closer to on time than we were last time. So this is uh, awesome. I'm excited. Also, I, know. It's, it's, I don't want to go on after that. I, I, my mid year's resolution is, is to keep these meetings somewhat on time. That is fair. That is fair. I like that. Um, so our la our training here is going to be um, a little bit kind of like the last one that we did, where it's a little bit more conversation based and a little bit less um, kind of like content download. But I wanted to do some really brief um, highlighting of some of the stuff that we've talked about this year, because it's been uh, I would say on the scale of chaotic years, it's on the higher end of the scale of chaos. So um, a lot of the stuff that we did at the very beginning talking about um, implicit bias, unconscious bias, um, has likely sort of seeped back somewhere. So I wanted to bring some of those principles back up to the forefront, but I also wanted to really focus the conversation on the fact that like none of the stuff that you learn about just basic what implicit bias is, is going to be the stuff that shifts the operation of 
bias in the world, right? You can learn how to recognize bias in your own patterns. You can learn how to recognize bias in the operations of a group. And none of that is going to shift the power balance. And so we're going to do a little bit of review about the implicit bias thing. And then we're going to talk um, for a while conversation wise, just about the concept of like, what does it look like to genuinely shift power around? What does it look like to lift up and make integral the voices of people who typically don't have the same amount of power and access in the community that folks who have, who have, explicit power because obviously there's a difference between explicit power a board has explicit power right you all are given um capacity by policy by governance to make decisions and so that power power is very formal and then there's power that's less formal right there's power that is influ influence there's power that is the respect that people have for one another the way they defer to one another um so i just want to be really clear while i'm using 50 versions of the word power we are a group here that is imbued with um like active systemic like category power and there are some pieces about power that are um about access and about um resources and having had routine and uh access to that over a period of time okay so that's rambly and really not clear i hope that that um vague description of what we're going to do is super helpful um and I just want to start with um, some review of really important points. Um, the first point that I think is really, really important to remind us all of is that bias does not require animus. For you to have a bias and for the system to be biased does not require that it actively and intentionally hates or wants to see a particular group fail or fall. And I think that is a really important point to keep bringing to the front uh, of mind, especially as we as you continue to do the work from here, because you'll notice that most of the work that you've done that is about really transforming power, it isn't, um, you know, Ku Klux Klan level resistance right you're not, you're not usually fighting a situation where people are um actively openly explicitly anger angerfully hateful and so sometimes it can be really easy to be like well we have a community that doesn't have a whole lot of like anger and hatefulness and so is there really bias so that's review point number one bias does not necessarily have to do have to do with having um, hatred or wishing to see failure amongst a group. All it biases is a sort of background preconceived understanding about a way of group a group of people are or tendencies they have, um, and the bias piece is shaped by forces that are not individual. So that's the second point that I really want to go, go to is the biases that we have are shaped by the environments that we're in and we have been exposed to, right? So the media that we encounter over a lifetime, the stories and narratives that we are around, the people that we make close friendships with and connections with, the cultures we engage with, all of those things are the things that shape uh, bias. And it, if we're gonna, we're rewinding a lot here, but um, bias is also just your brain operating the way brains are supposed to work your job is to change the programming of your brain because what implicit bias is is programming that your brain has received from the environment from the media from 
your experiences of the world that offer your you cognitive shortcuts for how to make decisions and your job is to slow down and to change the the kinds of inputs that are happening so that your brain gets a new rewrite of how how you need to make decisions and how you need to prioritize and who to listen to and who to bring value to and a lot of times that's going to require a lot of intentional shifting so explicit bias um and, and bias of any kind doesn't require hatred bias is shaped by the environments that you are in and so the only way to shift bias is to change the inputs that are happening um, and then a third piece that I just kind of want to really dig into before we have conversation um, is that you have to I'm trying to figure out a way to freeze this um, Folks in the community who raise concerns, folks in the community who um, ha are saying that things are still broken, folks who are raising up, um, did we think about this? Have we have we done any work around this? Um, those voices are probably the ones that we should be spending the most amount of energy kind of kind of focusing on, and they are also the ones that are typically going to demand the most energy as far as considering change because it's easier to keep a system going that's always been going and it's easier to keep rules and policies and guidelines and practices and procedures going that we always have had going than it is to completely reorder to completely re-emphasize to completely rethink um, one of the things that I actually got really excited about just listening to the youth right now was that um, their discussion is if we if we all made our entire focus um, of how we do work together, say maybe those UN um, goals it would likely change the work that we're doing, right? It would likely change power structures. It would likely change where we direct resources. And the youth are already thinking about that reality. So um, having just seen them, I, I'd invite the conversation. Um, this, is a, this is just two cents from having seen 15 seconds of um, presentation. I'd invite that you think a lot about what work as adults and leaders you could be doing to meet the youth on that particular project from the other end um from the from the lens of the the power that you have and also from the lens of what deciding what school is for and deciding what people who are in community in school can do together all right lots of ramble <laughs> Um, what I would like to do now, instead of ramble, is I want to have some conversations with you first about um, personal implicit bias and how we do some shifts around personal implicit bias. Because a lot of this year we've talked about the way that systems operate or how we can um, make changes in our thinking around um, the work that we do, if you will, like the, the, the decisions that we make, the careers that we have, the positions on committees, how we how we can interact with bias there. But bias actually comes since it comes from your brain itself. It comes from um, you and your actions and the way that you engage with things. So what I'd like us to do is do a little bit of thinking quite silently, um, maybe some jotting down if you have uh, piece of paper maybe or some kind of writing utensil keyboard etc um i'd like for you to do some writing down what this year 
we have that, that we have encountered or talked about and it doesn't have to be in times that we all have had together um i'd like for you to think about board meetings in general i'd like for you to think about issues that have been raised in the community um i'd like for you to think about um work that committees have done voices that you're hearing people um issues that you're hearing voices raise i so do a little bit of writing just for a second about what are some things this year that came up that maybe triggered or pushed on some of your biases that maybe pushed on we i don't know that i can handle that kind of change or that maybe pushed on um your sense of comfort if you will things that um like pushed against routine called for a really big change so i want you to do a little bit of writing around that and we're gonna take i i think we're gonna take about three minutes to do some just jot instances this year where things came up that pushed on your personal sense of comfort um and your your sense of like I kind of thought this was fair already, or I kind of thought we were already doing the best we could, um, and and I'm not sure how to change it. Does that seem, that, that may be really not clear, so let me look at people's eyes. Does that prompt make sense to you? Okay. Mark, can you just repeat that very last part that you said? I was kind of spacing out for a second yeah no totally um so you're basically just writing down instances this year that pushed on personal biases that pressed on your sense of what is possible to change um and even maybe how fast things can be changed anything that really challenged you personally in terms of um this is maybe not a thing that I thought was a problem and now I hear that it's a problem and I'm not sure that I understand or I'm not sure where to go with it. Uh, or, okay, yeah, I see it's a problem, but I don't know how fast we can really move or um, I don't know that we can really shift the system to take care of that problem. So I want us to just be spending a few minutes focusing on instances where um, that that call for change pressed on our our sense of can i do that or not Most people are looking up from their work, so we'll give it about another 30 seconds from here to just write up, wrap up whatever concept you're working on. And then I will have another question for you. All right, so 
this time, I would like for you to think about some time this year, some instance this year, when a call for change, a raising of an issue, um, galvanized you and made you think, yes, this is absolutely important and we do make to need to make this change and made you feel a sense of we aren't going fast enough. We aren't put, being radical enough. We could make this change more quickly, more deeply. We could uh, throw more races, resources at this thing. We could put, turn focus or time or attention toward. So in a time when you felt some sort of frustration um, around something that you recognized and heard as this is something that needs shift and felt like there are impediments to making that happen, even though I I am feeling like it is urgent, important, and if I were making decisions, I might maybe reallocate resources, reallocate time, or um, you know have a conversation about how we could totally break up the norm of things to get to the root of whatever the problem being raised is and make real significant shift. So the first one, the first question was really like, when's a time that asking for change, asking for recognition pushed up against your sense of, I can't change that fast or we couldn't do it at all, or I feel uncomfortable. And where was a time this year that you felt like the need was explicitly urgent, explicitly important, and that you felt like you needed and wanted to move faster, move with more definition, and you encountered some impediments or some slowing down as you were thinking about how that change could happen. Looks like everybody's looking up now. So that often indicates the folks are done with it, whatever recording they were gonna do. So now we're gonna do our third and last question. And that is, I want you to think about what of your values, the stuff that you think is the most important, you as a person prioritize in your life, where did your values, your, your motivation, your driving understanding of the world show up in the first instance and in the second instance. So think a little bit in terms of when I'm thinking about that instance or those instances of times where I felt like things were moving too fast or I felt like we just couldn't make that kind of change or I just wasn't comfortable. Where did your values and your driving sense of what's really important to you 
what was showing up there, what values, what thing that's important to you. And in the instance where you felt like we really could be shifting more dramatically, more radically, we could make this decision faster, we could move and there are just barriers and blockages in the way, what value or driving forces in yourself do you feel showing up around that instance? Okay, so most folks are kind of looking up and uh, so we'll give it about 30 seconds for anyone still writing or thinking to wrap that up. Okay, so what I'm going to have us do is I'm going to have, um, and obviously you, uh, all, all of the activities are always to in a, to a certain extent challenged by choice because um, you, you, you can't do work, you can't engage in learning if you're not like, if you're not consenting and, and willing. So if you're like, yet at no point in my work are you ever required to take part in any part of the um, reporting or discussion pieces. So I want that to be something that you don't feel forced to do, but that you feel like you want, you're, you're able or willing to push yourself to share um, in, a, in a space of like, really, really it's just willingness. It's a, it's a, I don't want you to do um, anything that I'm telling you to do because you feel like you don't have any other choice. That's not normally how, um, community change operates very well. So what I'm going to ask is, um, and we all know that Zoom is a little bit of a weird way to do this because, you know, we're all showing up at different places on people's screens. So what I essentially want is a quick report back from each of you on just the first two things. And I'd like an abbreviated version. So basically what I'd like you to do is tell us about the incident or incident instance in like a sentence or two. Well, enough that people could identify what it is that you are talking about. The instance that you felt 
resistance to you don't have to talk about what the resistance was you um you don't necessarily have to talk about what the conflicting factors were but tell us enough about it so that we can identify what thing happened during the year that you were thinking about that you felt some pressure um uh, some resistance within yourself and then also a little report back one or two sentences on the issue the topic the instance where you felt like an urge forward we're not moving fast enough we could be doing this differently we could be doing this more radically so um I will not call on people. I will let you decide um, the order in which you speak up. But um, as we get toward lots of people sharing, I will probably check in with folks uh, just to make sure that if you haven't shared yet that you get a chance. Sound good? Awesome. So, Mark, yeah. Do you, the, do you see the participants screen so if you just want to call on people to raise their hand? Be able to see that or you want me to facilitate oh uh no oh yeah i can see everybody it's a small meeting this time okay. yeah yeah awesome thank you question good access question all right so is there and you can you can if you like um either raise your hand with your physical hand or with your emoji hand um just to acknowledge that you'd like to speak and then um pretty much right after that we can we can do unmuting and stuff so brief overview of the instance that you felt resistance over, brief overview of the instance that you felt urged toward. Anyone feel like sharing theirs first? Go ahead, Jill. I'm always happy to make anything so others can learn from my mistakes. <laughs> um, the one that I initially felt resistance to was the school resource officer discussion happening in the midst of the COVID piece. Um, and then the one that I feel like I, I, I'm wanting more urgency to is really two things. One is just the responsibility for the facilities and the very sort of pragmatic and practical part of our role. But also, I think we haven't fully acknowledged the collective trauma we've gone through. And I'd like to find some way to make space for that as a community. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. Who next? Yeah, Emma. Um, the example where I felt sort of inner resistance was some of the discussion and training around white supremacy culture. Um, it just started to feel like these problems are so um, deeply systemically intertwined in everything that we do that it, it felt it feels overwhelming, like it's hard to um, start chipping away at it. Um, and then the time where I felt galvanized was around the um, community coming to us and voicing their concern with armed police officers being present in school. And it felt really important that there was um, so many people rising up to speak out against having the presence of armed police officers in school. And they were amplifying voices of marginalized people. And that's really important to me. It was a moment of like really um, powerful stakeholder uh, engagement. So that felt really important to me and urgent to me. And ultimately, I'm really glad that the process didn't go any faster than it went because it was a great process, but it definitely made me feel a little galvanized. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. Mia? <clears throat> um, one of the examples I thought of where I felt kind of pushed was we recently received an email from a community member about vaccinations that challenged my thinking on it. Um, and yeah, so I, I felt a little, little pushed there. And a um, uh, few where I feel galvanized are the, around the requests that we have been getting for increased mental health supports. And um, around what we learned, I also, I, participated with Emma on the school 
safety committee and what we learned about the work that the schools are doing around restorative justice and developing um, a foundation for restorative justice um, practices within the schools, I feel like we could be um, moving with more, uh, uh, going faster on that. Awesome, Mia. Other folks to share their instance of interior resistance, instance of interior urgency. And Kit. Okay, now I can talk. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So um, there are the, for the first first item or first point, uh, there are a couple of things. The um, I the first time I thought I felt that way was um, similar to Jill um, talking about the SROs. Um, uh, but there was uh, the other um, time I felt that way was when it wasn't a specific incident uh, or instance, but it was just a general um, throughout the year, I guess, um, or mainly last six months or so when the discussions uh, uh, was happening uh, uh, surrounding the racial un um, inequality or equity uh, towards uh, the BIPOC communities. Um, and this kind of dovetails with the second one where uh, I come from a very, um, I guess, um, humble background um, financially. And so uh, finances have always been a thing that I, um, I kind of uh, uh, gravitated towards um, financial long term sustainability. So that kind of resonates with me more. Um, and then my, my internal thinking, it's always my internal struggle. Um, I always think that the, the, uh, ec uh, the economic um, inequality plays more part um, in it. Um, and so that's where my, my internal struggle, and that's what I feel pushed is, is when I feel internally that it's the um, economic uh, inequality that that causes the not necessarily the issues but but the problems and, and whatnot more uh, than the uh, other you know marginalized group and whatnot they kind of go hand in hand because of the uh, systemic inequality and systemic all those things for years and years and years um, but um, what what kind of gets my uh, thinking going is uh, in the um, and this might be flawed thinking, but in, in the, the, the community that we live in and the, the state that we live in, um, does income inequality addressing that, um, uh, um, would that be a better approach than um, addressing, you know, more actively the, the other inequalities? Um, and so, um, you know, on the similar vein, uh, the, the one that, that I kind of feel like we need to push more at, as well is financially. Um, when uh, people were, you know, when we were in the budgeting season, when people were discussing the budgets and, and how, you know, initially we thought that the rate's gonna be 10% or 13% or whatnot. So how, the, how that would impact the um, ec you know, economically uh, marginalized or, or uh, people with, um, lesser means, how would that impact them? Um, and then um, similarly, the discussion about, you know, people coming to us with, uh, you know, the, the um, per capita spending for uh, comparing the schools, uh, the uh, MHS and, and um, middle school and, and as opposed to Roxbury and how that, that's impacting. So it's, it's more financial uh, for me. I don't know if, if that was a, I was, uh, I, was, I was able to express that or not, but that's where I am. That was really awesome, Annika, thank you. Others, your sense of resistance and your sense of urgency. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I struggle for reasons that are, are you know, very complex, but some of the some of, the, some of the talk around equity, both the magnitude of the problem and also um, 
the fact that I think there are some things that are being squeezed out of that conversation, such as, you know, some educational goals. I, I think we, we talk a lot about equity um, and we don't merge them with educational learning as much as, as I would like. And I'm kind of struggling with, with how to, to balance that. Um, and I'm also kind of just struggling as, as someone who um, sees themselves as progressive, but also wants to build out with some of the fact that I think that we talk to ourselves a lot about these issues. And um, there's a lot of people that, that we miss or we get very caught up in kind of language policing and you know how woke we are, that there's a lot of people we're turning off. Um, and I think purposefully turning it off instead of bringing it into the conversation and bringing in meaningfully. Um, and I think we could do a better job of that. And that that's kind of, you know, that's, that's been, been a struggle. And, and I also kind of feel as, you know, a 50 year old white male, it's difficult for me to kind of express some of those sentiments because I, I just find myself in a difficult position to talk about, um, yeah, talk about how using the term white supremacy can immediately stop the conversation with certain people. Um, even though that's what we're talking about and it's something we need to talk about and acknowledge. So struggling with that, um, in terms of what we could make change quick enough, I, I just felt just with this year with COVID, um, just getting just getting to a place where our kids are able to like engage and have uh, you know the type of, of school we want them to. I mean, I think we did a great job with that, but certainly when there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of moving pieces and we didn't know what was happening and um, you know, seeing, seeing kids, particularly last year, who I think really kind of struggled with not being in school, like that was the sense of urgency around just getting to a place where we're, we're healthy again, we're vaccinated, um we're safe uh you know kids are able to you know go to school safely teachers and our staff are able to you know feel safe safe and healthy that's you know it's it's nothing you can really do about but that has been like my overarching kind of like boy i just cannot wait until we are at a point where where we're all safe and healthy again and ready to awesome Thank you. Any, Chrissy? Yeah, I can go ahead and share. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Mara. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then yeah. Jerry, I'll grab you after that. I'm okay. sorry, I just had her hand up, too. Oh, sorry, go I, ahead. I was going to say, I was, I was like, oh, yeah, also Jerry. And then Amanda after that. I didn't follow protocol and have my hand up, so why doesn't Jerry go? And I can <laughs> okay. okay, that's fine. So, um, my personal sense of comfort um, was triggered a bit when I think this is more, um, I guess some of it is language and it's very stark language that we've suddenly started to use around things. And I've, my whole life has been, you know, I don't generalize, I don't stereotype. I look at individuals um, and it's not, it just really uh, triggers my sense of fairness and respect and justice to, um, and this is, a, despite the fact that I personally have had bad experiences with police, I don't believe in generalizing about police. Um, I know some officers who are just wonderful people. So it it's hard for me to deal with the language uh, um, that we've been hearing. Um, just to be very frank, when I think of white supremacy, I do think of Ku Klux Klan. So that it's hard for me to say, okay, to put somebody who's who's not intentionally doing anything bad in that same box. It's really, I struggle with that. Um, and then the other side would just be to, um, action. I'm, I like action. I'm not as much of a talker as you guys might, um, might have realized by now, 
um, I have a strong tendency toward action and I want to start rebuilding systems, start rebuilding trust. Part of that is also like wanting to bring the group back together, you know, having that one sense of team and community. So that is where I get impatient. Um, I want um, personal resiliency, courage. I want to kind of focus more on what is the positive vision. And I guess, um, again, and this might be, I I've had my own personal traumas and I understand that we have to go through that process, but I just, I also, I was raised by in the Midwest and I have that like, you know, let's get through the pain and, and make and do fix the problem, just move, move through it and make sure there's a lot of action in there. So I think that's it for me. Thank you, Jerry. And we'll go to Amanda and then Kristen. Go ahead, Kristen. Okay, everybody's just usurping all my rules. Go ahead, do whatever. No, go ahead, Kristen. Thanks, Mara. Um... Yeah, I think uh, police are, you know, haven't been around very long. I've only been here for a few months, but um, I think somewhere where I felt some re resistance around was, uh, I think it was our last meeting where we had to um, kind of make a quick vote and moving a decision forward around having a police officer at the um, the prom. And I, I guess the, the tension with me was, you know, it was like, oh, we need to just let kids be normal. We need to let them recover. We need to let them have... Um, just a sense of just, you know, footloose, fun, you know, moving into the end of their high school experience. And, um, and you know, and it was also kind of pushing up, you know, you know, I personally, I have not had a, a, a huge number of negative experiences with police officers, but it really pushed me into that place of thinking, you know, um, you know, that feels safe for whom um, and, and feels dangerous for whom. Um, so that was just, you know, kind of having to, I guess, you know, just make this like decision that did feel kind of, um, it seems sort of like a surface and it should be sort of an easy decision to move through and make, but it actually felt really loaded based on um, kind of the previous work that had been done that I think was done in, in deep and true earnest with, um, with community members. Um, and so it felt like a little bit of a, um, I don't know if like abandonment is maybe a little bit of a severe word, but it just felt like, okay, in this decision, are we actually being true to our stakeholders and to the process that was upheld with them? Um, and I think um, something that I was urged toward um, was we heard during public comment from a parent who is the mother of um, a young man, I think in the high school who has significant developmental um, challenges and her plea felt really dire and um, and I guess it, it for me it was like wow do we know what folks are experiencing do we know what's happening for folks in the community do we um, do we have mechanisms you know to hear from folks do we create enough opportunity to hear from people and how do we do that? really well in a way that you know folks have the opportunity to be heard but then that we also have means to um, act on the feedback that we're getting from community members so that just felt really um, inspiring and motivating and also a little bit dizzying I'm, I'm new to this process and so I don't know what protocol and or processes around you know community engagement but her plea just felt so dire and so moving it was just this moment of like we we have to do something but you know what is it and how do we go about it thank you kristen thank you kristen um I, yeah i mean uh just one uh, just one thing <laughs> um i think for me it's um it's a dance around, you know, I think the performative conversation on equity um, and like the white supremacy training culture and like all of this that in my head is like very performative, very, because then when I ask for data for BIPOC students, when I ask for this, there is a, a constant kind of like, well, 
don't say that, or you can be here, or you can be there. So like for me, that there is like some resistance around the power dynamics that you talked about uh, before, and like what that means when it comes to really being a collaborative member of a community like this. So I think that um, that has been like what I see is like a, um, I guess it, you know, the challenge for me because I come from the different world of, of being an activist coming in a space of power, it's, um, it has been when I have to ask myself, when do I have to put myself in my place that people are putting me under? So it's like, here's like, okay, do I have to sit here? And, and when, when, when is the dance, right? Like what kind of pattern am I wearing? So all of that, it actually, it, it, it counters some of my beliefs and values as an community driven person that doesn't speak for herself doesn't have an invisible army but i that i do have a lot of people that i am in constant contact with that belong to those communities that i often advocate for that so that is kind of like the different list that, that i kind of bring and then galvanize which i had to google just to be able to get in the right way um it's, I think uh, with the ESSER funding uh, and, and just like the, you know, again, the community collaboration and the community involvement, how does that look like? And how do we move slow, but fast? And I mean, like many of the things that people um, spoke about regarding all the community engagement pieces around the police and values and principles and then how that interacts with the performative equity conversation that happens. Um, and so I think, I think for me that like, so that that's what I bring. That's, that's what I have inside. Thank you, Amanda. And anyone else who wants to share a thing before I basically tell you why I had you do this exercise. <laughs> Hearing none, um, I really wanted to take a moment for, um, I think the, the past few years and especially within the past year, um, I think we've witnessed a tremendous amount of um, increasing refusal to see one another to work with one another to understand people's perspectives um and i don't uh it doesn't happen in the same places in the same ways but i have seen even in Mont i mean you folks read the front porch forum we there even in our community are definitely times where where you can see a this group versus this group happening and you all um are at least by charge um a group that is given the responsibility for making collective decisions for the collective good right to, for making decisions that that are going to 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 really take the, the everybody in it in a direction of thriving um and it means that you inherently have to sometimes sacrifice some things that you think are really really important and it means that sometimes you have to take new views on stuff that you th thought that you had already decided on and i wanted you just for a moment to engage with the reality that um your all of those things that you are that you are the things you feel resistance about the things you feel urged toward the things that you want to change the things that you're not sure about they're all driven by values that you hold and they're going to be important to you right they're going to feel really desperately important and when we get to a place that we are we are tugging on the things that are the most important to us that is absolutely the place where it gets really, really easy to stop listening or to stop reaching out 
or to feel completely overwhelmed like i cannot keep throwing myself at this problem over and over again it just never there didn't there doesn't ever seem to be a right answer there doesn't seem to be a way of fixing it there doesn't seem to be a way of overcoming the magnitude um so after a year of really tremendous pressures and increasing separation um and some of that is actually good separation like the in the intensity of people who've never had an opportunity to demand change to demand being seen to demand that that things start shifting so that everybody really does have a fair shot that ha that's had greater opportunity this year than in any other time but also the strong strong sense of i don't want things to change i don't want things to shift especially among people who've traditionally had more power and more access has also gotten much 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 stronger in the past year especially as um like uh, i think as joe raised the the pandemic wasn't just a situation that we dealt with over like a series of logistical concerns it was a threat to our interior sense of safety, our interior sense of whether everything is gonna be okay ever again, right? And that amount of pressure really, really, really pushes on the um, your sense of what can be negotiated, what can be collaborated upon, how to do change, how to move away from ways of doing things that have, um, that were structured intentionally to raise some people up and leave some people behind. And I just want to note that we having all of these really hyper intense conversations about fundamentally shifting basically how we do everything um amid a time when it feels like all we want to do is go back to the way things were or go back to some sense of comfort or shoot through, push past, and get things completely changed overnight so that we can feel maybe a new sense of comfort there. Um, when neither of those are possible, you cannot go back and it's not really possible to shoot forward. You're going to be in that place of tension a lot. You're going to be in that place of balancing. I heard a lot of that from you all. Balancing a lot of, um, I think and feel this way, this pulled me in a different direction or this challenged that thing that I fundamentally believed. Um, all of that stuff is going to be constant. And as you keep doing work combating bias and as you keep doing work taking out power dynamics that really um, throw some people under the bus, it's going to keep feeling tense like that. And it's going to keep pulling on really core things in you. And it is tempting to push to like push to one side and just just not not find ways to um, reach across the aisle, so to speak, or to not find ways to see that um, that that there are other needs calling out, right? Even people who are um, who are calling for something that you're like, I just don't see how we can move in that direction that fast or at all. Um, that there are needs speaking there, that there are real um, human needs, human values speaking. And so I just wanted to get take a pause moment during this meeting to recognize that your job is to hold the tension your job is to always be in that place of mildly to largely uncomfortable um, evaluating, wondering, trying, pulling one direction or another. Uh, and that in times of stress that gets harder and harder to do. And it can be really, really easy to forget that you're that you um, are working toward the collective uh, humanity of one another and you're working toward the collective 
like liberation and thriving of one another and that it will sometimes mean giving up some comforts that you have and sometimes mean going faster than you want to and it will sometimes mean going slower than you want to um and that all of those things that feel sometimes very frustrating are normal and continuing to engage with that tension continuing to challenge yourself around those issues with the overall focus that like we're we are working toward a community that really genuinely does work for everyone that that humanity piece i really wanted to to just make sure we raised before the end of the year was out so that was the purpose of this activity was to dive into the reality that you all are people who have taken um, upon yourselves the school community and the broader community and wellness and thriving and that that is a tough place to be when we don't all agree on everything all the time and when we're surrounded by centuries of systems that were put into place that really intentionally do make it so some people thrive and some people don't so if this year has felt a little bit like you are wrung out and like you are exhausted um i just want to raise up that i think that means that in a lot of ways you you all have done work this year that is critically critically important not just to the school system but also to like how we build community in general so i know that's a little bit vague and i know it's a little bit like kind of woo squishy cuddles or you know community holding hands but um that's the point that is the point of this particular training was just to get in touch for a moment with uh your humanity the humanity of the people around you the recognition of the tensions pulling on everybody and the understanding that you will get through the ongoing pulling and tensions and balancing by caring and working together with you with the acknowledgement that the systems don't make that easy to do because the systems aren't built so that everybody thrives. And that, friends, we are over time, but done now. So I hope that you enjoyed our walk through emotional turmoil and you're free to go about the rest of your meeting. Thanks, Mara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, that was a great exercise. Um, and appreciate, appreciate your time. and. Appreciate your timeliness too. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, we are on to the next topic. Uh, what do I do with my agenda? I know it's the ESSER update. Um, Libby, you want to take it away? Yep. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. So the board got this presentation uh, prior to the meeting and I have, we have your questions. Mike's here too, to answer, to help answer any questions that you might have um, in addition to the presentation tonight. So this is a presentation oops, on just ESSER 2. So there's been the CARES Act, there's been ESSER 1, there's been ESSER 2, and there's ESSER 3 that is now being called ARP ESSER that I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. This is just meeting to talk about ESSER 2. Uh, okay, just a this is the first two slides are just a reminder of the recovery plan from the Education Agency of Education. All of our ESSER funding should be dedicated to COVID-related expenses in one of these three care, one of these three categories: social, emotional, health, mental health, and well-being, student engagement, truancy, and academic achievement and success. What you see over on the other side of these columns are the Agency of Education's definition of those things. Okay, not my definitions, but the Agency of Education's definitions of those things. And you can there's a link in this presentation that you can click on and get to the agency's um, recovery guidelines that they have sent to us. So just a little overview on ESSER 2 in general, about 990,000 was alloc allocated to MRPS. 
The full application is due November 15th, 2021. We have already put in an application um, and we can make amendments through November 15th. These funds are to be used through 2023 and can be re retroactive back through March 2020, should we want to. We don't plan on doing anything retroactively, but we could if we wanted to. This is non-recurring. It's emergency aid dedicated to COVID-related expenses. Some samples from the AOE around usage would be construction and renovation that are directly linked to part of the recovery plan and what the agency is really speaking to is a lot of ventilation work for the safety and well-being of kids and staff. We, they say we can purchase instructional materials, we can purchase, uh, we can contract out for professional development for increasing teacher capacity. And we could acquire property if we wanted to, according to the agency, um, and we can hire human resources for learning loss, so dedicated to learning loss. Those are just ideas from the Agency of Education. Just a reminder to the board and the community as whole, our four pillars, our theory of growth for um, continuous improvement at MRPS is that if we have effective systems in all four of these places, then all kids will learn at high levels because of what we do every day. So you should, you've seen this before. Certainly if you've been on the board for a while, you've seen this before. <clears throat> so there are collective responsibility and collaborative practices because this job is too hard to do by ourselves. So our teachers work collaboratively together as well as our administrators. Formalized essential learning that we are prioritizing our curriculum. So we're guaranteeing and making it viable as to what kids will learn. That there's a timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate on that formalized essential learning. And that there's high quality instruction in every classroom. So our budget for the last three years has been based on these four pillars. Um, and much of the ESSER funding is based on these four pillars as well. So when talking to the staff and caregivers in MRPS, caregivers were given a survey, staff, uh, and we did a small community forum with caregivers. They also were encouraged to write in to me, which many did. Uh, staff, we did a staff meeting around that. We've talked to prin principals, have talked to their staff. Um, we've talked with the union and staff emailed lots of different ideas to me as well. Uh, these were the major themes that jumped out from both of those groups. Summer work and play opportunities for MRPS students. We have a new updated summer camp. So if you haven't checked that out lately, go ahead and look at that. Uh, addressing learning loss and academic support for students. Restorative justice training for staff and students. Uh, social emotional learning supports that include trauma informed instruction, which I would rather call resiliency instruction. Um, for capacity building with our teachers, ventilation work in old built in our older buildings, um, outdoor education opportunities across the district came through as a loud and clear theme. Outdoor fields improvement was a loud and clear theme. Student workspaces, particularly at MHS and MSMS, there's there's a feeling that there's a lack of that from the staff. Uh, mentoring programs, redesigning school spaces, particularly at MSMS and MHS, like the cafeterias. Um, Student travel and place-based learning, put some money in for that. That wouldn't be an allowable expense, but it was a theme coming through. The student travel anyway, wouldn't be an allowable expense. And enrichment opportunities for students. For the ESSER two, there's some constraints here because if we wanted to hire human resources or we want to um, hire professional development consultants, there's a time period for that. Um, and if we wanted to hire people, which we did, we needed to have this in sooner rather than later because we are coming to the end of hiring season right now. Um, so we had to make some decisions very quickly so that we would know that money would be available for us. Um, and on the flip side for professional learning uh, and contracting out with outside services, they get booked up pretty fast. And so now is the time that people are getting booked up. So we had to have those contracts in with outside providers and a plan for that. The AOE process in general is clunky for most of these things, not necessarily the whole agency's fault because they're getting their direction from the federal government. Um, and oftentimes the federal government isn't clear. So the agency of education has to go back and ask 
more questions. So an example of that is what's the difference between construction and maintenance of buildings? That's important because if it's construction, it's a whole different process and approval process for us in the agency of education than if it's simply maintenance work. And one of our pieces is tied up in that right now. And then construction timelines. We're way past when Andrew would be able to contact construction and contact tractors, engineers for the spec work, all of that kind of stuff. We are way past that for any kind of summer work whatsoever. Um, so, so that piece uh, came into play with ESSER II, um, and, but it's, it's in high consideration for the ARP ESSER funding. Um, and plus, it's really hard to get contractors right now in the state because there's only so many in every school district in the state, plus many of us who've been in our homes for so long, all year and a half, have desired to change our homes. And so the contractors are really booked right now. Also, materials that are at a sky high price. So there's a lot of things with, with construction that was a, that's a constraint for ESSER two in particular. Just some things about data in general around learning. I have uh, that, that literacy audit findings is a link to the district literary, literacy audit, which is a wealth of information. It was done by an, a Vermont group um, that if we have questions, Mike can answer some of those questions for you um, by Ellen Thompson and Mary Grace. It's po quite possibly some of the best information and most detailed information we've gotten. Um, across our district in literacy. So that's the district literacy audit that each school got their own literacy audit as well. Um, and there, but the district wide really spoke to the themes from individual schools as well. So these were the biggies that I pulled out. You can look and, and see the other ones as well, but, in, but there's a need for embedded professional learning to develop the capacity for teachers in literacy instruction. Um, in particular, a common model for teaching literacy. So parents and kids aren't guessing from one classroom to another as to how it's gonna go for, for literacy work. Um, a system of supports for student liter literacy learning in pre-K through 12 came around um, loud and clear in terms of formalizing really effective practices. Uh, that's something that fits right into our timely system to intervene, remediate and enrich. Uh, revisit writing instruction. Writing instruction was a major hole from this literacy audit across the district, major hole. Um, and so that was a piece that that PLL pointed to us as someplace that really needs some work um, across the district in terms of students owning their writing, seeing themselves as writers, knowing how to write really well and independently starting from pre-K on up. And then design a K-12 articulated literacy curriculum in reading and writing, which Mike is working really hard on, and we have a really good plan to get that in place. Um, that's formalized up on our website. People know how to access it. People know what to expect grade by grade. So we're working on all of those things. In terms of math, um, we don't have quite as in-depth data around our math work. Um, however, we know that we have to continue our embedded professional learning. We're now on about to, well, we're just finished year two with Christian Quartermanche, which is around differentiated math instruction at the K-6 level, um, which has been uh, fabulously received by our teachers and has consistently changed practice across the board. And we've, we've seen a ton of, we have so much evidence of success from this practice with Christian. And then also the system of intervention for universal skills K through 12. So looking at our screening data across K through 12, um, we have approximately 20 to 35% not proficient in grade levels according to those screeners, which tells me that we need to have a more uh, robust system of intervention for our universal skill work. And then we also need to think about an equitable distribution of human resources because some schools had more math support than others. So using all of these pieces, putting them together, for ESSER two, we've put in for social emotional behavior learning supports approximately $240,000 for that. Uh, summer programming is in there, as well as the community liaison position, which we have very few candidates for, uh, no social workers, which is what we have as a requirement. Um, we do have a couple that could possibly work, but they're not social workers. Um, technology needs, our student Chromebooks have been 
put through the ringer this year because of so much use in last year. So we need to basically rebuy a student Chromebook for pretty much every student in our district. Um, so we've been working on that. Matt, Mike and Grant have done a nice job, so it's not a huge hit, but there is some, some work that needs to be done in that. We have a ton of student Chromebooks right now at the MHS library, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative, that's what VTVLC is, that's for students who are still wanting a virtual learning environment next school year. Um, we have put into ESSER funds. So, and then professional learning, we had these pieces lined up um, to be paid for through a different place. And by moving them into ESSER 2, we we're able to free up some money for some other things because we knew these pieces would get through the AOE's approval process with, AO, with ESSER 2. So we put in for the literacy work, writing workshop, it's a three-year plan through Teachers College Reading and Writing Project out of New York City. It's a group I've worked with incredibly closely in the past. Um, and that group for the year one is going to be working with K2 and 5-8, the middle level. That's directly as related to the needs from our literacy audit. In math, we're going to continue the work with Teachers Development Group, which is a group out of Portland, Oregon. They've been working with group seven, grade 7 through 12. This will be paying for year two. The first year kind of got messed up, so we didn't have as much strength in year one because of the pandemic. Um, so actually, no, this is this will be year three, won't it, Mike? That's a typo. No, just two? Okay. Um, the pandemic messed things up a little bit there uh, because that's a, it's a very collaborative model where there's a lot of coaching in classrooms um, and it's very much lab design in classrooms with teachers. And so, because we couldn't do that they, and there was no travel that made it difficult this year. So we're going to ramp that up again next year. And then there's money in the in ESSER 2 for board and district visioning work for the future, particularly facilitating the conversation around what we'll do with our four buildings in the in the future and what our vision is for that piece. Um, in terms of positions, we have a dire need for for math intervention positions. This is a constant conversation at every budget year. MHS uh, had no interventionist for many years. Um, and so this year we're able to put an interventionist into Title I funding for MHS. We had 0.5s, but it, we never could hire them because they were so little. So we've put a literacy intervention into our Title I funding, which is another federal grant source. And we've hired an interventionist for MHS for math. Um, which one of our goals is that all of our graduates will have any choice available to them when they graduate. And our data is suggesting that they don't with math. Um, so that we need to really target that algebra one and two so kids can be successful and proficient in algebra one and two um, so that they can reach higher levels of math and access what are the requirements are before your school. Um, and then in addition, there was a desire and a need for a more instructional coaching from our administration. We have two people who currently serve as math interventionists on our staff who are phenomenal. Um, and so the plan would be to move them into a coaching position, one K through six and the other seven through 12 over the next couple of years. And so therefore we need the intervention, we need somebody to fill the intervention role. We're also thinking about these positions as moving into some other funding sources slowly across five years so that we can, we can keep them over time. And then finally facilities, we have, this is a picture of a one computer. It runs on Microsoft Word, Microsoft 7. It is the only computer that houses the program for the heat and air controls at MHS. And if that goes down, we will no longer have heat or air at MHS. And our, our guy, Tom Allen, has to override the system in order to make any changes whatsoever. So there needs to be significant ventilation work at, at MHS. Um, and I put, a, I put a picture there just so you could see that white keyboard and, you know, like the fact that Nobody runs Windows 7 anymore. I don't think we could even fix it if we wanted to when it broke. So we need some work on our digital, our direct digital controls at MHS. We had already budgeted 100K of this in fund balance. If you're on the finance committee, you've heard of this before. So this 135 is, the, is to get it all done. So we were gonna do it over a couple of years. This enables us to do it all at one shot. 
um, so we don't freeze over the next winter or have very hot classrooms or offices over the next winter, which tends to happen. So that those are the decisions for ESSER 2. For future planning the ARP ESSER or ESSER 3, the AOE is still very much in the process of understanding the federal guidelines. A major piece of the federal guidelines for ARP ESSER is community consultation. I had a good meeting with Amanda and Anna the other day to talk about what that might look like. And Anna, Anna being our uh, communication specialist is starting to put a plan together so that we can figure out what that community consultation will look like based on what the federal guidelines are. We also for our ESSER know that 20% of our allotment, which is about 2.2 million, has to is mandated to be devoted to learning loss due to COVID-19. So part of the plan is to move those intervention positions over into our ESSER, which allows us to have more time in getting that into our local budget. And it also um, will satisfy some of that 20% requirement. In terms of professional learnings and system development that was already planned for our funding sources, for different funding sources, for either local or Title II, which is another federal dollar amount, um, we had already planned for restorative practices work. We've, we've already signed our contract with the Core Collaborative, which is linked there to talk about belonging, dignity, and inclusion. We already work with Joelle Van Lent and we pay for that for through Medicaid dollars. Joelle is a psychologist who very well known psychologist in Vermont. She just actually did a, did a thing for the caregivers group this week, I believe, um, around resilience and trauma. Court, Kristen Cordemanche is paid for out of Title II dollars. I'm looking at Mike for to make sure that's right, which is the federal allotment. That's the differentiated math instruction. Curriculum development in all content areas and SEBL is paid for out of local funds with stipend work through for our teachers to do that work after after school hours so we don't have to have subs. And then literacy interventionists are already in title funding. So there was quite a bit already planned. Um, however, I, I added those bullet points in because they addressed a lot of the community and staff um, needs and wants from from that list I showed earlier. So that's that's our update on ESSER funding. We are happy to take questions. Great, let's do, I wanna um, not go too late. Let's do about 10 minutes of questions and we can move on to the next couple of topics. Um, Jill? Yeah, just real quick. Um, there are some acronyms or phrases in there that I'm not sure everybody knows and I'm not sure thinking I'm an education policy geek, like SEBL and then universal skills. I was wondering if you could just- Yeah, thanks, Jill. Always pull me out on jargon, always. <laughs> it slides off our tongue. So SEBL is social emotional behavior learning. And then universal skills, um, and I'll try not to be too wonky here. When you're talking about a multi-tiered system of support or what other people saw, call re response to intervention, RTI or MTSS, the different tiers mean different things. So tier one is are the prioritized standards. It's every child has access and we're guaranteeing that they're proficient in those prioritized standards. We're really working towards that. Tier two is the opportunity when kids need more time that we give them more time in those prioritized standards. The, the classroom teacher will reteach, they'll work in their PLCs to talk about it, that kind of thing. But it's still working towards those prioritized standards. There are some kids who, who have gaps from skill work from pre previous grades or um, they just never got it. They didn't have the time to learn it the first time in a priority standard. So for instance, I give the, the example of if a second grader um, does not have their letter sounds, right? That would be a skill that we expect second graders to already have gained proficiency in. And so that would be a universal skill for second grade. So, in, so what we're working towards is developing an effective system. So the most expert person in the school around that skill will be the person who's really targeting that, that, that work with kids. And it's quick and it's pointed and, and intentional. Um, so the universal skill work is just the core work. So we're talking about reading, writing, and math, essentially. Um, that we're naming and making a playbook for to make sure that all kids have these. And the idea is that we work ourselves out of an interventionist job because we do really well with it, right? <laughs> um, over time, we're not there yet. Perfect, thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Joel. Emma? Oh, sorry, Anakit is, is above Emma. Um, Libby, uh, I'm, I'm just for clarification, can you talk about the timing of this? When do we get the funds? What's the process? Like, do we apply for the funds and then get the funds and then go ahead with this? Uh, or do we actually go ahead and then get reimbursed for these? What you said, Anakit, is typically what happens, that we get the funds and then we apply for the pieces, we get them accepted and we move forward. That is not the case with these funds. Um, so we have applied for them. We know some things are, we know most of it is going to go through. Um, but we were told by the Agency of Education because of what I mentioned before, the definitions of construction versus maintenance. They're trying to figure out if the DDC controls are maintenance, which is how we're defining it, or are they construction? Um, because if they're construction, we have to go through a whole different process. Um, so right now our funds are held up. However, I, I'm not fearful of not getting them, which is why we've gone ahead with, with hiring for the interventionist positions and things like that. And so just- that, Did I answer your question, Annika? Yeah, yeah, just to play the devil's advocate. In worst case scenario, if we get denied, um, what happens in that case? The thing that would get denied is the DDC. It's not okay. the positions wouldn't and the professional learning wouldn't. Okay, okay. And, and so um, we, we are basically, we are, we're getting these positions and, and, and incurring these expenses and then we'll get reimbursed uh, yeah. when, once they approve, right? Yeah. And that, yeah. but the approve when the when would the approval come? Is it is it throughout? Cause or is the November fifteenth after that they start looking at it? What's the what's the timeline? They should approve it when they get the definition of the construction and maintenance. Okay. They've already told us that that that's the only thing. Typically, what happens like with Mike and his title grants? Mike, I don't want to speak for you. You want to talk about the the title grants just really quickly how that goes? I love talking about the title grants. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, typically, you, you enter your investments and you receive feedback pretty quickly from the AOE about those investments and if there's language that needs to change or um, something in the function with budgeting. So Grant and I work together on those. Um, and once you get the feedback, depending on the um, amount of applications they're receiving, they pretty much substantially approve it upon your submission, which means that you can act upon it. Um, like they'll say that basically that it's, it's good enough to go, go ahead and start acting upon those funds. And then you get final approval um, within a couple of weeks of that. And I think that that's a similar process for ESSER funds. It's even in the same system. So I would anticipate we'd hear pretty quickly. Thanks. Great, uh, Emma. So my question was around um, the ESSER 3 page entitled Future Planning, I think it's slide 10, um, you have a bullet point that says professional learning, the systems development already planned using other funding resources, and you have, among other things, restorative practices and resilience and trauma listed there. Does that mean that we're not going to be looking at funding those things or no, it means additional? Sorry, what? Sorry, they're already funded. They're funded through either Medicaid or title dollars or local funding. But we wouldn't those are, already, those are already good to go. Well, good to go, meaning like we're not gonna be looking at putting more emphasis on that and spending more money for, like for example, restorative practices was a huge theme in the School Safety Police Relations Committee. And it was one of our recommendations to um, bolster up some of that training and maybe speed it up and put more funding towards it and um, I see that it was one of the first things mentioned in the slide from staff feedback too. So I'm just wondering if it's off the table to consider putting more money towards those things in addition to what's already funded through other means. I would um, say that it's more of a capacity issue. We have the capacity to do so many things. So uh, should the board want us to do more of something than you're going to have to tell us what we do less of. 
So we have planned for things like restorative practice and like the work with Joelle for the capacity that we have in terms of time frame, in terms of um, you know, just meeting time availability, that kind of thing. So if we add more, then that means we have to take something away. Okay. Um, and then, well, I, yeah, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm totally satisfied with that answer, but we can table it for another time. I know we're trying to um, finish, but is there a deadline for the SR3? Like, what is the timeline for that? I lost the last part of that, Emma. Can you say it again? I'm sorry. Is there a deadline for the ESSER 3 applications and that what is that the timeline for those funds to be allocated? The deadline is in March for those for those pieces and we have until 2025 I believe for that money to be spent. We haven't been allocated that money yet. So hypothetically, like the question that I asked about potentially finding ways to give more money towards these certain priorities that could be discussed in more depth between now and March. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how to um, go about this given that I know we're trying to do this in a limited period of time, but it, um, the questions that I emailed ahead of time and I saw that Amanda followed up with some questions of her own, I don't feel like have been addressed yet. And so I don't know if that's something that's worth carrying over to the next board meeting or it would be possible to address them tonight. And you just need to ask them out loud because the community doesn't know what you've asked. Okay, well, and then maybe I should just look to Jim. I mean, I sent a handful yeah, of no, them. Go ahead, and go so ahead and ask them. Yeah, um, go ahead and ask them. It's, I think they can be answered pretty succinctly as it requires a different Okay, um, so I'm curious to know a little bit more about how the community and staff input informed your thinking. Like, for example, was there anything that you intended to be part of this plan at the beginning that isn't any longer when you come, have come to the final decisions or or the vice or the opposite, um, anything you weren't originally thinking that you've um, included. Um, and then I guess the integrated with that question is the one about just what you've done so far to, in, to um, really put the effort in to include voices, the people we don't normally hear, you know, BIPOC folk, caregivers of, um, and kids who are living with disabilities, um, people who need greater mental health supports, but might feel too ashamed or alone to ask. Um, and in addition to what you've done so far, if there's anything more you're planning on doing to hear from them, I heard that that's, it's a requirement for SR3, but I'm also wondering if there's anything about SR2 um, that you have done or are planning to do. So I'm happy to answer some of those questions. Before I do, I think one question that need some clarity for the administrative side of things is what is the entire board's um, perspective or expectation regarding the percentage of influence different groups have on these decisions. So people within the system who live within it every day have a very sometimes have a very different view of what's needed compared to those outside of the system looking in. So if you were to give the board now if you were to give each kind of a percent um, out of a hundred, what, what would that be? You're breaking up a little. Okay. That wasn't just me. Okay. I lost Libby too. Yeah. I think I, it was, you're asking if we were to put a percent on, I'm not quite sure what would the percent be. Per, a percentage on just to give it a shorthand folk, you know, folks who've been pushed to the margins their experience or input, I guess, weighting it within the, all the other considerations. That was the question. That's what I heard Libby asking. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Quick, quick run to our closer to the modem. <laughs> I almost got through the whole meeting. 
Um, yeah, so if when we're going out to get community input on pieces like ESSER 2, where there's no federal requirement for that type of thing. So the question would be, what's the board's expectation regarding the percentage of influence different groups have on those types of decisions? Um, because people within the system who live within the system every day have very different views sometimes of people outside of the system. And so if you were to give each group, you know, a percentage, what might that be? Um, I mean, I've, I, since my mute button is off, I guess I'll go first. I don't know if this is a thing that you want to have the whole board chime in on like each person right now, but my thought in answering that is that when we design a system that meets the needs of those who are the most vulnerable, it is a stronger system for everyone. And so if, so I would, I would weight their perspective very heavily. Um, I, and I also think of it as a little bit less of um, weighting their perspective and more of, it just takes a little bit more of our effort, those of us who have the power to be um, able to hear uh the voices of the people who are more at the margins because they don't see themselves as having as much of a voice as someone who is working with you who, who for whom the system already works um so i'm just i feel like you know mara made the point really clear and really eloquently in our in our um at the end of our training just earlier tonight that it's like it's on us as those of us who hold explicit power to be reaching out to those who have very little power. Um, so that's more of my thinking around the involving them in the process and going sort of like taking those extra steps to involve their input and a little bit less on how much of their considerations should be weighted in with all the other considerations. I don't know if that made it sound a little bit less clear, but that's where the question, my question is coming from anyway. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense that I do not want to go down the rabbit hole of, of CB discussion on this because I think it's part of a continuing discussion. But um, yeah, I think that's a very well taken point, Mia, that it's maybe not about a percentage, but about making sure that that all voices are heard in the decision making process. Is that a good summation? I think that's a good summation and also that it I have seen real evidence of when we design a system for folks that are at the who are at the most vulnerable within our system it is a benefit to everyone so if you're asking specifically for like how heavily would i weight the consideration of the needs of folks who are currently more mar marginalized and vulnerable in our system i would weight them pretty high so just to answer the question directly as well um Kristen. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I had some questions just around the summer programming. I was wondering, it looks like um, it's kind of been lumped in with the community liaison piece um, under SEBL, but it's uh, budgeted for 240,000. I was curious what the breakdown was between the liaison position and the summer programming. So that's a kind of a basic question, but um, I also just had some access questions about um, summer programming. I sent those to, um, uh, to Jim and Libby last week and had just, I was curious if transportation had been considered and had been built into that. I know that some of the programming, some of the free programming starts at 9 a.m. I know that is like right up against a, you know, a, a start time for work for some folks. So I'm just curious if transportation was considered for that. Um, of course, I'm thinking a bit about Roxbury um, families who are a solid anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes, depending on where um, they're located in Roxbury in order to get into Montpelier. It's a hall. Um, and I also had wondered about, um, you know, some of the free camps look really fun and really exciting and they also seem to require um, equipment, like you need to be in ownership of a mountain bike or lacrosse equipment. And so I was wondering if there was just, you know, if, if equipment was a barrier to access um, for, for youth, if that could be made available to them, um, just like maybe in, like 
the program rents it on their behalf of just if, if resources could be allocated for that. Um, and I also wondered about food, if like food um, was also going to be provided um, to any of the free camps. Um, and then also I know like some of the free camps are really kind of more like a nine to one, nine to 12 offering, which I know is difficult for say like working parents, especially of younger kids. Um, so I don't know if some of the funds are available to um, subsidize or support students to attend like the full day part two programming. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious how like access to the summer programming was was thought about um, and how some of those funds, because I know it's a one time infusion. I know the summer is feeling so important to um, to youth. I know the parent who spoke with us at the beginning um, in public comment was talking about how we have some kids that have not accessed their peers or their school community in over a year, which breaks my heart. <laughs> um, working with a bunch of those kids in the district where I work, I know that is very real and very true. Um, and so I'm just curious how, yeah, that group was, was thought about and um, just trying to increase access and get these folks to tap into some of the great programming that's being planned for this summer. So with transportation, we worked, we looked into it with STA, which is our bus company. They do not have the capacity to provide transportation. So we looked into it and we don't have the capacity to do that. Um, as far as equipment and pieces like that, we have a bunch of equipment. We do not have mountain bikes, um, but we do have a bunch of equipment there that kids could access if they needed to, with the exception of the mountain bikes. Um, in terms of the timing of we worked as we were designing this we worked with part two to ensure that part two would be available to bring kids over to the camp at mhs and bring them back so we have that set up we've also any family who has applied for subsidy for part two um, will be they they're going through the subsidy process to see how much this they they earn for subsidy and then the district is paying the difference of that. So people who qualify for subsidies will, will be going to camp to part two for free. Um, so that's already taken care of as well. Um, in addition, I know Beth mentioned the EL camp. That's not on this list, but that is happening this year. It's just not on this, the summer list because it happens every year and it's very intentional for students with um, who are on our English language rosters. So it's just, it's just a different piece. It's just accessed in a different way. Um, then these kind of, I think I answered all your questions. I think. I had a, asked a question about food, but as I'm- Oh, remembering food is free for everybody. So yeah, yeah food is okay. free for everybody. So that if they're at camp, they, they can grab food from the cafeteria. It's, it will be the same as last year. I think Amanda, and then I think we're gonna move on to our final um, yeah, so in terms of um, remedial intervention in the summer for kids, I know that I, I'm a little bit confused about looking at the literacy PowerPoint and then hearing from the administrators last week um, around that there's nobody behind, which is, you know, what I kind of thought was like, nobody's behind. Um, and, and just kind of looking at like, I'm just trying to really understand if kids are just taking ESVAC right now, the standardized testing, how can we gauge or like, how is it, you know, like how, how is all the data, how is it, the data that was looked at to conclude that kids do not suffer any setbacks? Even though we do have some data, even though the uh, literacy report says that there needs to be um, that the ESBAC requires deeper analysis, um, but also we're not desegregating data. So I'm like, I just have a question about like how we came to that decision and then what uh, remedial programs and interventions are we using this summer for those kids? So like I know a number of families who pay for private tutors for the summer. Um, so what happens to families that cannot afford that $60 an hour a week um, to pay for that remedial program in the summer? Um, so that those are some of the questions I have. I 
and still trying to understand why I never saw the, the community liaison position. And so it was not in my radar about any of that. I have a question regarding uh, mental health support systems and how that's included in the SDBL plan. Um, I have a question around contractors and if there was ever an RFP for some of the services or if they're just like, here's the, who we know and that's who we wanna hire. And are those contractors that are hired, are they proven to show innovative ways and cultural competency to include kids with disabilities, kids from different marginalized communities? Um, I have a lot. Is this a done deal? Is this something that you decided? Uh, how how was like the democratic process with the teachers that really gave input? Um, and can we see that you know how that what that looked like? And then I have so many so many things because it's the, so it just feels like it, it just was thrown and then decisions have been made and then there's um, there was not so much of a collective practice or process that we were included in um, in that. I just had a question around how that worked. Let me see if I had more. Um, I'm just gonna be honest, we're, we're, we can't get all these questions. The question is, can you talk a little bit about the data on a slice 11 um, of, the, of the literacy districts assessment, which is how we have yeah, the percentages break down around um, the grades in the literacy um, PowerPoint. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that those were all good questions. There's a lot, and we, we did not have time to delve into to all or even a, a sliver of them. So, Libby, why don't you try to do the best to sum up what you can, and then let's move on. I'm trying to remember them all. <laughs> I, can't. I feel like maybe the um, most important so, question to answer is like, how, what is the timeline of this? And is there any flexibility? Like, I think that continues because if we know tonight that there's flexibility and time, then it might not be so urgent to get all of our questions answered tonight. But if we know that there isn't flexibility in time, what does the board believe their role is in this work? I, mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, we are not, you know, I, I think we have an advisory role and I think certainly a, a being consulted role, but it's, it's, it's technically not our decision to make. Um, Is, isn't a budget our role though? Budget and money? Isn't that part of how we spend our money and how we're accountable to the goals and to uh, the population that we serve? We approve, you know, the the overall budget, but we don't operationally control the budget or operationally control grants. It's developed by the administration. Yeah. Jill. Thanks. I'll be just real quickly. I um I appreciate that question because I think that's really important for us to keep in mind. And I, I I sort of resent the implication that the educators and administrators who have obviously spent a lot of time on these recommendations and these decisions that are based in really good practice and do have all of their students in best interest in mind. I sort of resent the implication that they're somehow not thinking that way. They're the ones that are actually in the building every day. So. I, um, I'm really excited that we have an opportunity to get this infusion of federal funds, which is not normally what happens with education. And I'm also pretty impressed that there is, knock on wood, enough um, latitude in the use of funds that we can do some really important work there. So I'm excited about the possibility. I understand the reservation. I understand the, the need to dig in. I mean, I still have five different terms that I'm not even sure what they are, but I absolutely, you know, we have hired and we have empowered um, the people who have dedicated their lives to making these decisions on behalf of our students and are doing the work every day. And I, I just wanted to make it clear that that, that that is not the opinion of everyone on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, 
Mia, and then we really will uh, turn because we still have two agenda items on the agenda. Um, I just wanted to try and answer the question directly. I also see our role as advisory um, and, and as a consultant and a thought partner, and that's the frame within which I pose my questions is to help the administrators and the staff who've been working on this um, really push their thinking in 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 doing this work and spending the funds wisely. It hasn't, it does, it's, I, and it's not that I don't trust that you are, I deeply trust that you are making really hard decisions with all of this. And I also know you heard a lot from the community and I appreciate that. I also, I just am really taking to heart some of the stuff that we discussed only a few minutes ago with Mara about how we bring our own lens to all of these things. And as somebody who is a representative of, of the community, um, I think it's, it, it's part of our role as the board in this advisory and consultancy capacity to be thought partners along with the administrative leadership in order to help um, make the strongest decisions possible for everyone in the community. Thanks, Leah. Um, school safety and police relations uh, committee community report. Um, Emma, is. <laughs> Okay, I just, um, I see that Amanda has her hand up and I just feel like. No, we're, we're moving, we're moving on. Um, we, we need to, we need to wrap up. It's, it's 8.50 and, and we, we can have the discussion later, but we need, we need to flip along. Um, so to be clear, there will be time for further discussion. Yeah, we can certainly discuss it on the second. I, we just, we, we we need we need to move on. I mean, we need to respect people's time. Our our meetings are completely blowing past eight thirty. It's not respectful of people who need to get to their families. I know we have big things to discuss. I mean, maybe we're gonna you know maybe we can discuss expanding the hour or the meeting to three hours on a regular basis. Um, but we need to be a little more disciplined about time. And everyone has had ample ample air time tonight. Um, so we have two more items on the agenda, um, and, and we're going to get to them and hopefully wrap up by nine o'clock, which sadly would be a victory, um, given, you know, we, we need to be more, we need to be better about it. Well, let's just move on then so that we don't keep, you already said yeah. that, so let's do it. Well, okay. I mean, can somebody, does somebody want to project? I don't really know exactly what we're asking for here. I guess board approval for um, this document that was created by committee members, um, sort of summarizing the work that we did as a way of communicating it out to the community stakeholders. So I'm not sure exactly, you know, what our intention is. I know that there was um, the potential to uh, put it in a newspaper, there's potential to put it on district um, website or social media accounts, um, but it's just a way for our committee, the School Safety and Police Relations Committee, to communicate out uh, the work of our committee. So I don't know if anyone has um, the ability to share that document. I mean, it was in the board packet, but just for the sake of Orca and the public who are on the call. If you have um, it, Emma Mia, you can pull it up right now. You can. Sure. Okay. You should be able to share your screen. Yeah, I'm going to have to navigate to it. It's in the board packet. <clears throat> I've got an Emma. Okay. Thanks. Let me try. Yeah, thank you. There we go. And um, just the, the piece that I would add to what Emma just said is that the, the, um, because the committee is a school board committee, um, we wanted to get to make sure the board was saying, and because the board speaks publicly with one voice, we wanted to make sure the board was seeing this and saying, oh yeah, 
this is this is what we heard from the committee and this is you know as far as recommendations go this is what we're taking in from the committee and putting our thought toward Great. So I'll scroll since it's there. Um, so I'm not sure what the motion would look like, but I, you know, I move that we approve um, the dissemination of this document. Okay, do you have a second? A second. Uh, any discussion? Yeah, no, thanks. This, you guys did a great job of putting this together. Um, it really sums it up well. Um, let's move to a vote. Uh, advocate? Aye. Jill? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Uh, Amanda? Aye. Mia? Aye. Emma? Aye. And with a share screen, I don't know if I'm missing anyone. I know Jerry dropped off and Andrew isn't here. Um, I think I got everyone. Um, and everybody should listen to the In the Schools podcast, no matter what, but definitely episode six, because three members of the committee are on it and they um, did a beautiful job. And thank you, Libby, for your thoughtful questions of them. It was awesome. Great. Now, thanks for thanks for doing that. Um, a great suggestion. Yeah, the podcast uh, is awesome, and it's it's binge worthy. Uh, I don't. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> um, final board action is the VSBA resolution, which I don't have in front of me. Libby, do you have it in front of you? You can. Um, pop up on the screen. Can you give me a little context around the resolution, please? Yeah, let me recall it up. Um, you might find it quicker than I can, Jen. Um, so every year, the VSBA, the school board is up oh, there. You go. Thanks, Jill. The school board association um, asks school boards for what they call resolutions to support. Um, so it's for legislation. Sometimes it's uh, it's kind of just the piece of where school boards want the VSBA to go. Basically, um, this is based from uh, G. Collins School Board in Rutland. I'm not positive exactly which district that it is called, but it's in Rutland. Um, and it's, it's coming out of the idea that there is a lot of um, people in the legislature who are allowing public and federal dollars to go towards private schools um, who do not have the same acceptance criteria as public schools, who do not have the same equitable belief systems as public schools and they're getting public dollars um, to spend is what basically this one is, is behind. So um, it was sent to all superintendents uh, through Jean Collins, who's a superintendent in Redland, and um, to see if school boards would support this resolution. He has very, uh, oh, I guess I could. Go, go ahead, Amanda. He has very outdated language. The term handicap hasn't been used for a long time and it has been changed in the in the federal laws too. So um I I I I cannot they need to change that to basis of disability. They need to add a, a few more <laughs> if I'm gonna if I'm gonna say yay, because um and so what and then the question that I have is is your is this like against the independent schools or because what, what I'm reading right now is an approval process for public public and independent schools right I mean my understanding is that it's it's 
um, making sure that, you know, largely other religious schools or independent schools that actually often have actively discriminate based on, you know, private beliefs do not get the same funding opportunities that public schools do or do not use public funds, which, you know, now in some cases they do. And, and that was certainly, I think, made easier under the previous federal administration. So for instance, say, you know, a Catholic or, you know, uh, you know, evangelical school that um, discriminates against same-sex couples. Yeah, and that's a conversation with state house right now with lawyers and all kinds of people are trying to figure out if they can actually do that. So I can't seem to raise my now that I'm sharing my screen, I've lost my powers. But I think that I think this is getting a new sense of urgency because there was a recent court decision that actually supported some private schools getting um, public dollars, even though they were clearly in their bylaws and on their webpage discriminatory against um, trans students and, and same sex parents. And it was really pretty blatant. And yet they were allowed to use public dollars and they could discriminate against students for that. I, I agree with Amanda that there's some there's some big gaps and in, in this does it is a little um, exclusionary and outdated as far as that particular sentence. I'm, I'm sure maybe they're using a national template. I certainly support the concept, but it is a little unfortunate. It's not a little more inclusive of, of the immediate. I don't, I don't see parochial schools um, being discriminatory about things about ADA, but I definitely see they're clearly still discriminating against um, students who are, you know, um, non-binary and, and other um discriminatory practices than just what's listed here thanks there are there are discriminatory practices with um students with special needs in that they don't have to admit them they can choose who they admit with so right. I think that's like my alma mater yeah that's where that comes from so if, if the language is what's holding the board back, then I would recommend that the, the board write to the AD, the, uh, sorry, just hold it in mind, like the SBA, yeah, yeah. thanks, yeah, and just say, with this updated language, we'd be happy to support this resolution. I see um, people other hands up. Yeah, I was just going to see my Nancy, Anna, Anna, Emma, and I have. Um, yeah, I think this also falls under the category for me that Kristen was talking about when we were talking about getting rubbing up against our comfort levels. I don't feel like I'm educated enough to vote in support of this tonight. I mean, I definitely want the, the fabric of public education to remain really strong in this state. And I've seen and done a lot of reading and learning about how that is being degraded in other states due to charter schools and private schools. So I'm interested in it, but I'd like to learn more. And I wonder if VSBA also could potentially, um, you know, take some time to present to us. We can definitely ask them. But I would, I would agree with Libby that I think maybe like table it for tonight and revisit it. Yeah. I was just curious, like what the process is from here. I'm guessing that the VSBA has sent this to, or Libby, I think you just said uh, a superintendent sent this to all superintendents asking for every, every school board to vote on it. Is it that the VSBA, VSBA will requires like a certain percentage of school boards to vote on it before they adopt it. And then if they adopt it, what do they do with it? They just send it to the legislature. What's the, so what maybe if there's, if, if anybody knows, maybe this is something we would find out from a presentation from them. Um, what is the process and what are we hoping to achieve? I'm guessing in, influence the legislators, but maybe there's more to it than that. Do you all get the emails from VSBA? Uh, yes. You get those? Yes. So, okay, good. <laughs> Just making sure that you did. 
Um, and we didn't miss anything there. Uh, so a couple, I want to say I saw it a couple months back, but I, I can't put my finger on the exact date I saw it. Um, you got an email from them that said, we are taking um, resolutions from school boards, yes. right? Yep. So that comes every year. Um, and school boards can write these resolutions. You could write your own re resolution. And basically what it, and yes, I believe there's some sort of voting mechanism. How, not being on a school board though, I don't know exactly when that happens. I think it happens at the VSBA board meeting. And so, um, so there is some sort of voting action and the, the resolutions that pass, I'm not sure how, I'm sorry. Um, they would be, they're the ones that the VSBA takes the time to, to lobby the legislature with to make sure, like it's, it's basically the, you're giving direction to the VSBA in yep. certain areas as local school boards. And so sometimes they get put in this way where there's one that a board feels very strongly about. And so they want it spread to the school boards across the state before that vote happens, right? At the, at the VSBA board letter level to get more support behind it. Does that make sense? That's my understanding of the process. Yep. Right. Okay. That's very generalized. Yeah. Okay. That is helpful. Uh, and again. So Libby, thanks for explaining. So uh, the, the first part, the, the last couple of paragraphs uh, are the sentences. The first part is clear to me. The second part, is there a school approval process? Are they talking about the funding? Um, approval process or is this new schools being approved? I, I'm not quite clear about the last sentence. It says the Maribyrn school approval process. Um, yeah, the state agency of education does have to approve both in both, I mean, public schools certainly, but, um, but they have to approve, they have to be approved and accredited in some way by the agency of education. I mean, they don't have to be, but in order to get any kind of state funding. funding they have to be yeah and is that is that approval process like annual approval process or do you get approved once and that's it i bet it has like a five-year cycle there's some sort of a review process and now i'm really reaching back into my um aoe days but yeah there, there's like one or two people at the agency of education who regularly review these and re-up their accreditation but it's very i, I would i would say it's pretty cursory mm. And so, you know, so the last sentence, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, I think that I, I'm guessing that's what they're trying to get at there, that there's it, some sort of a new standard for that approval process that um, assures this kind of accountability and yeah, okay. Um, so it sounds like uh, we want to, um, they have someone reach out back to them and ask if they can give further information on the context and also that some of the language is in need of updating. Um, is that kind of the consensus? Um, does anyone want to take that on? I think it's would be one of the, the Sues that would be be probably the person. I can take a stab at it. That's helpful. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't want to update until I know what it is for. You know, like if if it's like I would really like to know it's their own. Well, Joe, do you want to reach out and kind of ask both those questions, a little more context, and then yeah. I think and regardless, I we, 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 have, we don't have to support it, but I think it would be better. There was the, uh, just the auditor's office apparently released a report like a month or so back at the end of March on this exact topic as well. So I think I think what they're getting at is this has some some momentum between the court case and the auditor's office report about how public tuition dollars are spent. Um, but I'm happy to take a stab at that and I guess send it to you, Jim. Yeah, it'd be great, and then I can I can just forward it along to um, uh, uh, to VSBA, and then you know, depending on what we hear, we can either move forward with it or um, or not. All right, excellent. Um, let's have a motion to adjourn.
So moved. Uh, a second. Second. Uh, Advocate? Aye. Mia? Aye. Jill? Aye. Krista? Aye. Alonda? Aye. Emma? I just want to quickly say before I vote aye that I don't think anyone was, um, I didn't hear, I didn't share Jill's sentiment that people were inferring that they didn't trust the administration um, or Libby or any of the staff to make decisions about ESSER funding. I just think, you know, it's such an imperative, giant, you know, influx of money into our district that it feels really critical and important. And it also by necessity has to be rushed. So it's definitely um, rubbing up against my own comfort levels. And I think it's rubbing against others. And I do think that the agenda would have been probably better planned if that were the only thing on tonight's agenda, because I, I think it's only natural for a lot of us to have questions about that. But there was, I, I don't mean any disrespect to Libby or any of the admin team um, in the questions that I posed tonight. So with that, aye. Uh, lost track of the vote. Kristen, have you voted? Mia? Aye. I, I think we're at a majority, so let's just uh, I think we did it. wrap up. Okay. Thanks, everyone.